Hi there, I'm Gordon and this video is all about making a pilgrimage to the cave. By far the best vintage gaming museum I've ever visited. Retro heaven? You'd better believe it. Located in a converted 18th century mill near Stroud, deep in the heart of the English Cotswolds, the cave will be familiar to anyone who follows the excellent RMC Retro channel run by Neil. Over the years, so-called cave dwellers like myself have watched Neil repair and review a wealth of vintage home computers, while building what would eventually become a museum to house, film and even visit them. During my trip to the cave, I had a chance to sit down with Neil and ask him how it all started, as the history of his RMC YouTube channel is intertwined with that of the cave itself. Hello cave dwellers and also Arcadians, because we've got some of Alex's Arcadians in today, so hello everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I think you've done an absolutely amazing job, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful to have you and to finally meet you. And you... I got Gordon to sign my book, Digital Retro, today, which really made my day. It wasn't Fantastic. a setup. I didn't bring <laughs> one in my bag and twisted his arm until he actually did it. <laughs> my favourite book. Like, it's got coffee stains and everything on there. Mm -hmm. so tell me exactly how your YouTube channel started. When did so, you start? So YouTube channel was started in... Well, registered in 2010, but I didn't actually start making videos proper until 2017. So it was registered for the purpose of selling things on eBay when uh, I had a small collection of retro. I had a financial hole to fill and it was like, oh, no, I'm going to have to sell my precious collection to, to get through this, this little uh, dip in the road of life. Um, did that and, um, and then completely forgot about it. And then when it came to 2017, I was just trying to connect back with the hobby and with people with similar interests to me. And I was amazed to find when I logged onto YouTube, I had a couple of thousand subscribers just off the back of these uh, eBay videos, which had no narration. Um, it just had the audio from some old adverts for the things that I was selling over the top. And um, for some reason, people had subscribed to those to, to my channel for, the, for those videos. So I wasn't really starting from a clean slate. I had um, a small audience and I wanted to connect with that audience and find people with the same interest as me. So as soon as I made a video, suddenly they started commenting. You're oh. alive, you're, you're, <laughs> you know, you're still into the hobby, you're doing this. Once you'd finished reviewing all your stuff, <laughs> did that coincide with people sending stuff to you or did you actually have to then go out and try and find stuff? Uh, I had to go out and start, well, actually, no. I was working in IT at the time next door to an electronics firm who had a skip. And <laughs> magically, from time to time, these incredible things would appear in the skip, like a 486 PC. Hello cave dwellers, there exists a place I call the magic dumpster. I walk past it most days on my way to and from my car at work, and if by magic, amazing gifts seem to be waiting for me. And this latest find is no exception. Sitting atop a pile of rubbish, can you believe it, was this outstanding looking 486 PC. And I unashamedly dove in and took it home with me. And that's kind of how the idea for Trash to Treasure formulated, which right. is a popular series yeah. on the channel. It was literally trash that I was picking out of a, a skip uh, and then making videos on and restoring. And then from there, I also started buying things on eBay, on um, Gumtree. And it was on Gumtree where I made a fantastic find. It was an Amiga 500 with monitor. Um, 20 pounds was the asking price. Just never happens Six now. Six years ago. And I thought, okay, brilliant. You know, even if it doesn't work, we can, because the Amiga 500 was so important to me as a teenager, we can make a really passionate series about that. I can pour my heart and soul into it. Went and picked it up. Turned out it was a very rare early model of the Amiga 500 with a mechanical keyboard, uh, a very early version of Kickstart. It was just a ridiculous find for 20 pounds with the working monitor. And that became the Amiga 500 Trash to Treasure series, which is what, just rocketed the channel in terms of subscribers. About one month when I put that, the first video of that series up, I got 10,000 new subscribers. Never had that many subscribers since in a month. So it's quite normal for when some retro channels grow to a certain size that their viewers, their members start to send in stuff, review this. Yes. But that's where most people stop. Whereas you went, no, wait a minute, I could build the entire <laughs> museum. Here. Yes. Yeah, so stuff got sent in, that became content. Um, and then um, it got to the point where I had to rent some more space to put all the stuff in. There was so much stuff coming in. Uh, and then it got to the point where I felt bad about the stuff. It's like, you know, I really care about all of this retro stuff. It can't just languish in a loft. Um, some of it waiting to be repaired. Um, so what do I do with it? Either I need to get it where people can access it and enjoy it, or I need to sell it. So it was you know, a fork in the road. At the same time, my landlord of the space where I was decided that they were going to convert that space into residential property. Luckily, the owners of this gorgeous 18th century mill, Heber, came forward 
and said, we might have a space that you'd be interested in. As soon as I saw that space, I thought, okay, the, the, a dream could be realized here to, to open a museum. I don't necessarily have to sell all of that stuff. I can put it on display and I can get it into people's hands to use it. So during the week, you film your videos, you during do the, the repairs, week, yeah. and yeah. then at the weekend, most weekends you're open? Pretty much every weekend we open up, people can come and visit. And this is just really lovely cycle of people watching the videos. It becomes almost aspirational to go, I would love to step into the cave and see this, you know, for myself and, and you can. So it, it, it's his own marketing, if you like, just the very fact that I'm here tinkering away, making videos. It makes people want to come and, and try them out and enjoy the space. After teasing us with videos detailing the construction, the cave finally opened its doors to regular weekend visitors in March 2022, while providing a studio for Neil's YouTube videos and a lab for restoration projects during the week. The chance to meet Neil, his fabulous volunteers, not to mention like-minded enthusiasts, are all key factors in visiting the cave. But what makes the collection fairly unique and special to me personally is the period that it covers and the fact that you can play on original hardware. As a child of the 70s and a teenager of the 80s, I want to see home computers from Sinclair, Commodore, Acorn, Texas Instruments, Atari and Amstrad. And you're going to find original examples of all of these at the cave, along with the chance to actually play them using vintage controllers and CRT monitors, but with the convenience of fast game loading from modern SD interfaces. After all, you don't want to waste your precious time in the cave waiting for a tape to load. If you're more into PC gaming, there's several examples of early systems when Doom was the pinnacle of sophistication. Games consoles are also well represented from the pioneering Pong clones of the 70s to the original faux wooden panelled six switcher Atari VCS, early Nintendo and Segas, as well as my personal favourite, the Vetrex. Again, all plugged in and ready to play. And while there are glass cabinets and stacks of boxes full of additional exhibits, including some rarities like the Taitung Einstein, Dragon 32, and Auric Atmos, it is possible to request further examination or plug them in for a demo where possible. Check the Retro Collective FAQ for a current list. As for machines not on current display, such as the Intellivision or ColecoVision consoles during my visit, you can just fire up a Mr. FPGA system on a big telly, which delivers the next best experience to original hardware. And not just any Mr. system either, but one that Neil developed with the electronics company Heber on the floor below. You've also partnered with one of your neighbours <laughs> yes. or your landlord to actually produce your own electronic products. That's right. So Heber um, are genuinely really into retro. Um, they have a history of working in the gaming market over decades. And uh, they came to me and talked about creating the Mr. Multi system, which is a, a way of consolizing the really fabulous Mr. project and putting it into a nice case and many more projects beyond that, which I can't talk about, but they're working on lots of really, really exciting projects. As a multi-system owner myself, I'm certainly excited by what's coming up, but back to my visit to the cave, where one of my favourite sections showcased the handheld games of the 70s and early 80s, which represented the affordable alternative to investing in a home computer or console. While Nintendo's Game & Watch series gets most of the attention these days, I'm most interested in the handhelds which employed vacuum fluorescent displays, ingeniously switching fixed graphics to emulate popular arcade classics of the day, most commonly Galaxian and Pac-Man. Notice how the fixed display here meant Pac-Man, sorry, Puck Monster, always faced the same way regardless of the direction it was moving, but how Munchman here actually embraced this limitation and only allowed him to eat when facing towards his snacks. And to be fair, even the officially licensed Pac-Man on the legendary Atari VCS console couldn't face up or down either. I remember owning a CGL Galaxy Invader 1000, Entex Space Invader, and the acclaimed Astro Wars immediately before an Atari VCS arrived at home and saw them relegated to long car journeys instead, with the sound turned down, of course. It was also great to see the legendary Simon game, represented in both giant full-size and mini pocket versions, although maybe my own memory could do with refurbishing. Once again, the cave lets you grab any game you like, pop in some batteries and start playing. Oh, and of course, more modern handhelds are also here, including all the Game Boys, the Atari Lynx, and check this out, a pocket Neo Geo. Nice. I also enjoyed the room, which pays homage to the 1980s shopping experience of UK retailer WH Smiths, where so many of us browsed and bought our games. Notice the authentic signage and beige shelving, and even a rebranded RMC logo in the WHS style. It's really like stepping back in time. 
But while this could have just been a static exhibition of tapes, the cave cunningly presents a barcode reader to drive a hidden MISTER system, in turn allowing you to pick up a game cassette, scan the code, then actually play the game on a TV a few seconds later. Right now it only works with a selection of games labelled with a red sticker, but it's a brilliant interactive idea. Beyond this, there's shelves packed full of retro magazines, including of course a selection of Crash and computer and video games. I remember buying this View to a Kill edition in 1985, plus a bunch of retro themed books, including one you saw earlier. I'll try and make an updated edition in the future. And as you wander around, don't forget to open all the drawers as you'll find discs, tapes and original game boxes to feast your eyes on. Even the kitchen area where you can buy a cuppa is adorned with a wall of floppies. If, like me, you're of a certain age, it's pretty potent stuff, and I'll admit I had a tear in my eye as soon as I walked through the door, not just from the waves of nostalgia, but also recognising the room from Neil's various videos and finally seeing it in person. This is the genius of the cave, as before it became a public museum, it was already a studio and workspace for Neil, whose channel of course provides a regular reminder of what you could see if you too headed to the Cotswolds for a visit. Equally important though is Heber, not simply the cave's landlord, but a viable electronics partner for creating new products, not to mention helping to repair ageing exhibits. Plus their mill building itself, with space for other retro related projects, including the more recent arcade archive, where you can play classic original cabinets from the 70s and 80s. And I'll be making a separate video all about that place, so look out for it soon. It's just a wonderful partnership, and in addition to that, they've got all the space of the mill, which is where we were able to put the word out and say, well, let's create a collective. I'm only on the top floor. If anyone else has the same passion as me for pinball machines, for arcades, for anything else that would complement what we're doing here, come and rent a space of the, uh, the mill. And that's exactly what Alex did with the Arcade Archive. And we're talking to other people about extending this even further. And now we all work under this umbrella name of the Retro Collective, which tells you exactly what we are, I think. It's just a, a like-minded people celebrating these hobbies. Yeah. I think it's fair by now to say that you'll have got the impression that I rather enjoyed my visit to the cave. In fact, if you're into this sort of thing, I can't recommend it highly enough. Once again, in a world where so many retro cafes, bars and shops seem to concentrate on the 1990s and Nintendo in particular, and even then mostly present games using emulators on modern LCD screens. It really is refreshing to experience the 1980s celebrated in their full 8-bit glory with original hardware, controllers and TVs. A visit to the cave just by itself is well worth it, but the fact that you can make a day of it by also visiting the arcade archive on the ground floor, well it just makes it a no-brainer. Retro heaven indeed. They're open most weekends and you can book morning or afternoon sessions online, lasting three hours each, for £15 per adult, after which all games are free to play. Book both the cave and the arcade archive for the same day and you get 10% off with an hour in between to pop up the road to the nearby cafe for lunch. Find out more and buy tickets from retrocollective.co.uk or by using the link below. I hope you enjoyed this video and really hope that you get a chance to visit in person. Meanwhile, check out Neil's RMC Retro channel, and if you're new to Dino Bytes, I hope that you get a chance to watch some of my other videos too. Thanks for visiting, let me know which are your favourite vintage video games in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.